A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. As I watched, thrones were set up and the ancient one took his throne. His clothing was bright as snow and the hair on his head as white as wool. His throne was flames of fire with wheels of burning fire. A surging stream of fire flowed out from where he sat. Thousands upon thousands were ministering to him and myriads upon myriads attended him. The court was convened and the books were opened. As the visions during the night continued, I saw one, one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. When he reached the ancient one and was presented before him, the one like a son of man received dominion, glory, and kingship. All peoples, nations, and languages serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not be taken away. His kingship shall not be destroyed. Verbum Domini. A reading from the second letter of St. Peter. Beloved, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that unique declaration came to him from the majestic glory. This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come down from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Moreover, we possess the prophetic message that is altogether reliable. You will do well to be attentive to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Verbum Domini. Oh, 
Dominus Fabiscum. Et Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundo Matteo. Gloria Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with him. Then Jesus, then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, Do not tell the vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Verbum Domini, Laus Christe. Today we celebrate the Feast of the Transfiguration of Jesus on Mount Tabor. And this is a theophany, we call it. This is a manifestation of God, of the Trinity. And on one level, it's to encourage them, because he's about to, to strengthen them as he goes to his passion in Jerusalem. But it's also the Church Fathers and you know, he says this, rise and do not be afraid. This is a great encouragement to see the glory, the power of God. It even reduces Peter to kind of babbling, you know, let's, let's, let's set up three tents, let's stay up here, you know, <laughs> let's camp out. And, <clears throat> you know, we see God as the protagonist. He's the actor, he's the one that's solid. And Peter's kind of reacting to this, overwhelmed by the glory of it. But it is a great strengthening for them for what they're going to endure when they see the crucifixion, that they have had this vision, they've experienced the glory of God, and they see they're going to see this suffering. This also reminds us of his baptism. That was also a theophany earlier in Luke's gospel. Again, Jesus is there. We hear the voice of the Father. This Holy Spirit is there as in the form of a dove descends upon him. We hear the voice of the Father saying, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Tabor again, a manifestation of the Trinity. We have Jesus, the voice of the Father, the Spirit in the form of the cloud, the Father's voice saying, This is my chosen Son. Listen to him. Moses and Elijah are, Elijah are speaking to him of his departure, of his exodus, of his paschal mystery, his passing over to the Father, uh, through that suffering, death, and resurrection. That exodus that we all will experience and be liberated from sin and death by passing over to the Father in Jesus, by having that relationship to the Father through him and, uh, and in the Holy Spirit. The Church Fathers would see that first theophany, the baptism in the Jordan, as a revelation of our baptism that Jesus sanctified the waters of our baptism and would speak of it as a, a, the first regeneration that we experience, that first immersion into the, the mystery of Christ, where original sins wiped away, we're forgiven our sins through baptism, we're given the Holy Spirit, we're made new creatures, new creations in Christ, completely transformed. That's the first regeneration. Tabor is a revelation of with the catechism and speaking of the Father's teachings as a revelation of the second regeneration that we are to go through. And this is the transformation by God's glory through our resurrection, 
and our humanity being glorified, being glorified by the holiness of God, by his glory, to be transformed, to share an eternal life uh, with, the, with God. We're told today that they saw his glory, that it, he had become dazzlingly white, manifesting the very glory and power of God that transforms us, that inserts us into the life of the Trinity. And that second regeneration is not just you know, when we die and are raised again, but is also this ongoing conversion, this ongoing call to holiness, this daily repentance and renewal that the life of a Christian, that we experience as a Christian, beginning again. And we see glimpses of that resurrected life that we're tending to, that's the goal. We see glimpses in this life. We experience a real sharing in his life when we live by the power of God. When we do accept the cross and seek his strength in that cross, we live by a new power. We go, we're taken up to a new level. We experience a new peace, a new joy. And the command of the Father today at Tabor is listen to him. Be obedient. Listen to his words. Be obedient to him. Have communion with him through this obedience. And we are led to eternal life. We're led to, to a beginning of the experience of eternal life and to the fullness of eternal life when he comes again in the second coming. So Moses and Elijah, as I mentioned, are speaking to him of his exodus in Jerusalem, his paschal mystery, and this is the path to glory. You know, it's, we don't go around the cross. It's through the cross that we experience that resurrection. So Peter says, Master, it is good that we are here. You know, we are here contemplating you, experiencing his glory, contemplating the, the face of Christ, you know, amongst uh, image this contemplation. You know, they set themselves apart to, to be on Tabor, to experience in a special way the mystery of the Trinity. Yesterday, I had some friends in town and I was, uh, we, they wanted to see the cathedral, St. Paul's Cathedral here in Birmingham. So we went down there, blazing hot day. You know, we've had some horrible days here in Alabama. And we step into this delightful, cool cathedral and we're admiring the stained glass and the statues. And there's a woman there, she tells me there's adoration. I'd forgotten. Every Friday we have adoration, I think, at the cathedral. So I went to the back chapel and just prayed there. And it was just such a, you know, sometimes you get, I mean, we're here in our chapels, we have adoration all the time. And there's something about when you're taken out of your routine, the routine can kind of take, you lose sight of the gift of it, the specialness of it. And it was special to be in this hot day, to just step into this chapel, to have adoration, Jesus there in the Eucharist, and just to take a few breaths, you know, to be renewed, to reorient your life to him, you know, to contemplate him. That's what we're made for. We're made to have that communion, that union with him, to contemplate him. I was at World Youth Day in Poland and we were having our daily mass usually in the hotel and they gave us a nice big room and we'd have mass and they had other groups at this hotel and uh, might have been the first night even or second night we were there and a, a group joined us and I had mass and we kept, we had a, a host that we kept after mass, a consecrated host and we had some adoration and and one by one, you know, the people peeled off after some period of time. And I'm sure they had things to do. One had to take care of some group stuff, you know, some stuff for the next day. And all very good reasons, you know, to leave. And uh, it was me and another priest who left there at the end. And I thought about our sisters, uh, the poor clothes of professional adoration. They live a contemplative life, a cloistered life. They're set aside to contemplate the Lord. They get rid of as many distractions as they can. They don't have an active apostolate. That this adoration, this worship of God is so important that it's worthy to have some given a special gift to spend their life in adoration. 
not to leave, not to have some other pressing matter to call them away, set aside to be with him on Tabor, to contemplate him. Today, Brother John Therese Marie, the Eucharistic Heart of Jesus, who we see uh, serving here just about every day, you see, and he's renewing his vows today after the homily. He's a consecrated person. He professes the three evangelical councils of poverty, chastity, and obedience. He, too, is called to manifest this special being with Christ, to be set aside, to be completely dedicated to him and to his work of the kingdom, to contemplate him, to be united with him, to live the mystery of Christ in a special way, to embrace the life that Jesus did. Jesus lived a poor, chaste, did not take a wife, obedient life. This consecrated life is rooted in baptism. It draws from the grace that we receive in baptism. And it's also a special gift given to a person that they can belong to the Lord in a special way. John Paul II, in writing about the consecrated life in Vita Consecrata, he speaks of the laity as showing forth Christ as the alpha and the omega of all things, the foundation and meaning of all things. But there's a secular character to the role of the laity. They're, they're called to be in the world. Holiness is found you know, in church and in the world, sent out to transform the world, that all of creation belongs to God, that they, the laity are called to be out there to prepare the way for the coming of the kingdom, to proclaim that Jesus is the beginning and the end. He is the source of all things, and he is the goal of all things. And all our works are dedicated to find, to guide everything to him, to, you know, to, to use all the gifts and strengths that we have to serve the coming of that kingdom, the fullness of all things that's found in Christ. And certainly the laity through baptism confirmation of sacramental life are transformed in holiness and to put Christ first. But they are in the world, right, transforming the world. The consecrated person is to show forth the goal which all things tend. They are to manifest this eschatological life that we're called to, the end goal of belonging to Christ and eternal life, him directly, him alone. <clears throat> John Paul II in his document on religious life, he said, the consecrated life proclaims what the Father through the Son and the Spirit bring about by his love, his goodness, and his beauty. That they are to manifest that beauty and goodness of God in the world, where the Trinity is the source of that beauty and goodness. It's, it's the radiance of Christ on Tabor that's supposed to be manifested in all our vocations. So he, John Paul would, St. John Paul would describe the first duty of the religious is to make visible the marvels wrought by God and the frail humanity of those who are called. And I was thinking about this too, especially women religious, I think, manifest that, that beauty of God, that tenderness of God that is so important today. I, I see it time and again, I saw it at World Youth Day. You got a nun and a priest walking down the street People are drawn to the nun. <laughs> There's something about the habit, the beauty, the radiance. That's just compelling. That just draws people. That manifests the goodness of God. We could speak of the second regeneration, this transformation, as a journey in contemplation. As a person grows in holiness, his prayer life deepens. And he becomes, that contemplation is union with God. As we grow in the gift of contemplation, we're becoming more and more united with him. And certainly religious are supposed to, to image that in a special way. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's what they are striving for. So by the vow of chastity that Brother John Therese Marie uh, renews today, he is to manifest this total dedication to God with an undivided heart is to be pure of heart, to be totally centered on him. And this is a reflection of the Trinitarian love that's going on in the, the life of the Trinity. That we who have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit 
are called to return this love back to God. And this is in no way, the vow of chastity is in no way a denigration of marriage. They both, in a sense, inform one another. I know the married life images in a very concrete way uh, the sacrifices that love entails, it calls for, and manifests the very love that Jesus as a sacrament, the very love that Jesus has for his church, that he is present in that marital love. It's holy, it's good, manifests God and his love for the church in an extraordinary way. I, I was recently, I got on Facebook, hadn't been on there in 10 years or something, and I was looking up old classmates and friends, and I was kind of surprised. The pictures that were most compelling or most moving were with these people that I knew years ago with their families, those that were married. And it was really beautiful. Some were doing extraordinary things, you know, and, you know, in Timbuktu doing whatever or something incredible. But the most compelling thing, I would say, oh, that guy did it. You know, he got married, had a family. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. By taking the vow of poverty, uh, we manifest, the religious is to manifest that God is, is man's only treasure. You know, we have so much stuff today. I, I find this hard to believe. I just saw a study that said the average American has 300,000 things if you itemized them. 10% of the population has uh, like remote storage facilities for their stuff. And there's now a, a movement, purely secular, just to simplify, just to get rid of all the clutter and all that stuff that can divide our heart, just taking care of it, just maintaining it. And it kind of squeezes God out of our life. It's a call for all of us. I mean, the religious, consecrated person always has to be renewed in these vows to live in better. But uh, and finally, obedience. Manifesting that the food that Christ was to live by was to do the Father's will. And this really is the essence of holiness doing the Father's will. It's not about how much grace we receive or how many devotions we do. It's being united with God and doing the Father's will that leads us to union with him. The consecrated person is to proclaim this kingdom, this work, this regeneration that God wants to do with humanity. And may we be faithful to that. We ask you for our prayers, especially for Brother John today as he renews his vows. He's a great gift to our community, a real servant, and a person you can ask to do anything, and uh, really models humility, I think, for all of us. And Father Leonard has been his, uh, his director in temporary vows, so we thank him for his work as well.